So welcome back everybody. So in the last class, we were looking at a crystalline structure and we were asking ourselves um, that if we look at a crystalline structure in a very sim as a simple lattice that is held being held together by spring forces, then what is the relationship between the modulus and the spring constant? And if we represent, if we know the pair potential, then can we relate these two? And what we found eventually was that the modulus can be thought of as a energy density, where your numerator has a potential energy and the denominator has a volumetric type of term. Now why, this, why is this important? It is important because this tells us about the overall idea of a crystalline material. That a crystalline material is something where energy can be input and it can be held inside the volume of this material for some time. This idea of looking at a structure in a crystalline, uh, uh, in this particular, in the viewing the modulus as an energy density is very helpful if you especially want to understand how is it that materials which flow over a long time have finite uh, modulus at any given point. Because if eventually everything is flowing, if we go back to that uh, old analogy of Deborah that even the mountains are going to flow over time, then what is the point of having a modulus? This is, everything is flowing, so you should just be uh, done with one viscosity term or one something that descri uh, describes the dissipation forces and that should be it, right? But what happens is that the moment you put energy into a system, the energy is going to get locked in. And depending on obviously what kind of material it is, if a material has a behavior that overall, even, even if over a long period of time it starts flowing, the instantaneous energy can be or the energy put in can be can be stored inside the the volume of the material for an instant of time, okay? and it can be stored there. It can decay over a much longer period but it can be stored for some time and that because of that reason you can assign a kind of modulus or an instantaneous modulus which is related to this storage of energy at a given instant of time. Right? So uh, in a perfectly crystalline solid by the way, there is no mechanism by which the stress can ever relax. Right? So if we go back to this. Uh, uh, go back to our simple idea of a crystalline solid. We are holding all of these atoms together with these springs. Now the springs have no mechanism by which they can relax. So the idea of a perfectly crystalline um, material is, a, is an ideal situation. And in this ideal situation, uh, so a perfectly or a perfect, just a second, I am going to rewrite this. So, a perfect crystalline and perfect, I am just going to put here in quotes because what we mean is a very idealized condition. So, uh, in a perfect crystalline solid, there is no mechanism. available on any time scale for the stress to relax. So for solid bodies, if you have a solid which is which has a uh, inherent relaxation time of the order of years, if you are doing an experiment in the lab, that time scale is not very important, right? You are just looking at the energy you put in and how much energy is getting stored. So uh, assigning a Young's modulus or a modulus for so such materials makes perfect sense. But even for other cases where you can see uh, something 
in your experiential time scale if a material is moving even then you can assign a modulus for this based on this idea of energy density. But let us quickly contrast it. So, the idea of the crystalline solid is to be contrasted with that of a viscous liquid. So, in a viscous liquid this stress whatever stress you put in is going to relax and it is going to relax quickly. Right? So, they do not have uh, any mechanism by which they can store energy and that is the contrast between that. So, let us say you have a fluid. Uh, so, this is let us say a control volume and or an imaginary box which are and these are these different uh, fluid particles which are distributed in a, some random fashion and you are applying some kind of a force on them. Then what happens? So, here what happens is in a simple fluid so let us say water this volume will distort and your molecules or atoms will move to slightly new places where they will be displaced. And it can so happen that in the disordered form there was some intermolecular distance between the different atoms right. But here what you can have is you can have a suddenly a cage type you can form where an atom get, get trapped in a very close packed structure but this atom does not like it. So, it is going to jump back to some other available location and it is going to move and the moment it is able to move this this is the place where your stress has built up and your stress is going to relax. So, this time scale uh, and we can show that I am not going to go into details of the calculation. So, it can be shown it can be shown that for simple fluids and simple fluids the example would be water for simple fluids this lambda which is the relaxation time scale so relaxation time scale is of the order of 10 to the power minus 12 to the minus 10 seconds ok. So, basically what is this lambda? The lambda is basically the time where these molecules are going to readjust and going to distribute them again in such a way that they appear very similar to the way they were distributed before the application of the force itself ok. So, that is the time lambda is basically the time for molecular rearrangement in this particular case. So, now you can see this time scale is actually really small right. For experiments done in the lab these time scales are way too small and you can assume in many cases in an idealized sense that for simple fluids the stress relaxes instantaneously ok. So, uh, reasonable, uh, uh, reasonable assumption for experiments conducted at, at t much much greater than lambda. So, let us say you are doing an experiment where your measurements or your data is being sampled at seconds or maybe minutes or hours. In that case 10 to the power minus 12 is way too small. So, if you are doing an experiment such way in such a way that the data sampling rate is so much slower than lambda then we can assume uh, reasonable assumption for experiments conducted at sorry ok let me just be consistent is that the stress relaxes instantaneously ok. Uh, 
but this behavior is going to stand in contrast to the soft materials that we are going to see and in fact in in strong contrast time scales of uh, relaxation time scales for polymer melts or polymeric solutions. We are later on going to do some experiments in the lab with polymeric solutions. We are going to see how they behave. So, in strong contrast relaxation time scales for polymeric melts solutions uh, can be often of the order of the milliseconds to seconds. Okay. So, you can see how different these values are 10 to the minus 12 versus this. Now, these are again uh, actual in an actual experiment these values have to be measured and they can even be lay, uh, lie outside of this range. So, I am just giving an approximate range for many of the common polymeric melts and solutions that people encounter. So, this is a very nice segue for us to segue into a topic called polymers. So, we see that polymers is uh, polymers are some materials which are now going to display soft material type characteristics, but what are polymers? Okay. So, let us take a look at polymers in general and this is a very good um, the polymers are very good example materials for understanding soft materials and viscoelastic behavior because they have been very well studied and more importantly they are produced at a very very large scale industrially. So, because their industrial usage and uh, you might have heard of all the now the problems with uh, polythene right and how it is becoming a huge problem for uh, our uh, environment and the reason it is becoming a problem for the environment is because of the scale of use and the scale of industrial production is massive. So, these polymers are materials which have been produced or we have understood how to make them very well. We are we have understood how to control the properties of these materials to a very very fine degree. We have come up with many different manufacturing techniques for them and as a result of which they have been very widely studied and very widely categorized. So, they are a very interesting class of materials to begin with to understand uh, some of these soft materials. So, to understand polymers we will take a very simple molecule okay, and the simple molecule is this one C 2 H 4. So, this is one of the simplest of the alkenes and this is also called ethylene or ethene. and this C 2 H 4 and we will see what this is, this is for us this will be for the uh, monomer we will I will just write this right now and I will explain why I am writing this. <coughs> so, this is a very widely used material and uh, it is produced on a very large scale industrially and it is used to make a polymer which looks so, once you so if you take the polythene uh, poly uh, sorry the ethylene molecule and polymerize it and you probably already know what polymerization means then you have to take these monomer molecules and keep on adding them together till the, the actual molecule becomes very very large. So, in this particular case you would create such kind of a large molecule by bringing together all the different different carbon bonds, uh, carbon atoms okay. 
and this can just go uh, keep on going okay so the, you can recognize this this is your monomer unit right here which is now going to be repeated let us say n times in the polymerization process and this n <coughs> usually can be very very large ok. So, you are going to polymerize it and your n uh, often can be easily of the order of 10 to the power 2 to 10 to the power 5 even higher sometimes. So, you end up producing very very large molecules due to this process. Such large molecules are different than our simple molecules uh, that we are accustomed to. Uh, simple molecules are oxygen O2, uh, it's very simple structure you have two atoms, nitrogen N2 again having two atoms, water H2O having three atoms, those are also important compounds right. So, there is exists a class of materials where the actual molecular structure is very simple, simple in a relative term obviously this uh, there is still research going on into structures of water etcetera. But from the perspective of the molecular structure and uh, the unit of the material it is rather simple, but here this monomer unit keeps on repeating so, the monomer unit actually keeps on is being repeated for a large amount of uh, by a large number. So, end of the day what you will end up with is a molecule that is very very long that is composed of a backbone of carbon carbon in this particular case carbon carbon uh, chain and that chain would have a huge number of carbon molecules. So, compared to your simple molecules these molecules are extremely large they are much larger and therefore, an appropriate name for these class of materials is also macromolecules. So, these uh, these polymers are also often termed as as macro molecules and some researchers have even called them uh, giant molecules. This is actually a very nice book uh, called Giant Molecules by uh, two Russian authors Alexander Grossberg and Alexei Kokolov uh, if I pronounce it correctly. Uh, it is a very nice book for uh, leisure reading of these materials. Now, another example of such polymers is DNA for example, DNA uh, is also DNA is one of the DNA molecule is one of the largest uh, chain polymers where this n can be of the order of 10 to the power 9 or even 10 to the power 10. Okay. So, this is how our long polymer chain is going to form. This is uh, this kind of an arrangement is also called a linear arrangement. So, all the carbon carbon uh, bonds are laid out next, uh, next to each other. Okay. So, this is a linear molecule. So, we have drawn and uh, just so this is or a linear chain ok. So, <coughs> I will just make a quick note of this that linear here, uh, linear does not mean that the molecule itself is 
like a straight line. Linear here describes uh, a type of polymer, a polymeric a polymer or polymer material. Um, and it dis and uh, it refers to the arrangement of the polymerization units the reason we are specifying this is because other types of uh, structures are also obviously possible. So, we will uh, later on contrast them with the linear models. Okay. And uh, just to make a note is polymer molecules are not straight. in a geometric sense. Which means that if you take some polymer, if you put it in water, this polymer chain itself might look something like this. Okay. And this is a long and coiled polymer, but if you look at some small portion of this, and if you zoom in here, you will just find that these are again the carbon carbon bonds are all arranged in some linear fashion. This is once again polyethylene. And obviously, this keeps on going. So, this is uh, important from that perspective uh, for us to understand the structure later on we will be referring to these. So, you can also have so in contrast to the linear molecules you can also have a branched. So, this is so you can have a branched polymer molecule and in a branched polymer molecule example you can also have so you have these branches at different locations. So, if you zoom in into this small bit, what you will see is that you have the carbon carbon bonds obviously, and then suddenly at some location there will be another branch of carbon which will be going off and forming a short chain. So, this is a, a branched structure in contrast to the linear arrangement. So, in branched polymers there are many different varieties that are possible and some of these are named just because of the uh, manner in which the polymer molecules themselves are uh, look uh, in a schematic diagram. So, for example, uh, short branched. So, in a short branched you will have maybe a chain and then you will have these short branches going off. So, this is one morphology. Then you can also have what is called as a long chain and in this case you can have a branch uh, sorry a backbone and then it branches off, but the other branches are also very very long. So, that is one kind of morphology. Another morphology which some people have called a comb morphology is you have a backbone structure, but then you have different branches going off as if it appears like a comb. Then you can also have what is called as a star.
structure where you have different branches coming off from a very small location. So, this it looks like a star obviously that is why it is being called a star and then finally, you have random distribution here well as the name suggests there is no perfect there is no um, real structure that you can assign on morphology that it appears like and the branches occur at random at various locations of the main. Uh, so, these are all uh, by the way uh, these are variations of branched polymers. So, what we are trying to discuss here basically finally, was that we have uh, these polymer molecules and these polymer molecules we took an example of ethylene and we showed that this is uh, one particular ar arrangement of the polymer molecules would be this linear combination. And there are other ones obviously that are possible and we discussed some of the different morphologies. Uh, of the branched polymers and they can have these different forms. The reason we are discussing this is because different manufacturing techniques or different polymerization techniques would lead to different kinds of overall or final structure of the polymer itself. And the final or the structure of the polymer chain also influences very strongly its physical properties. So, it will affect its density, it will affect its uh, soft material behavior as well. So, it is very important to know uh, in a given situation if you are doing an experiment let with say uh, polyethylene oxide and uh, you are making solutions of polyethylene oxide. It is very important that for a set of experiments the material be made in the or manufactured in the same way. So, that whatever its structure whatever is branch structure or a linear structure be the same throughout the different experiments. Right? So, if you are a person who is conducting experiments you have to make sure that you have to source it from the same vendor perhaps at times to maintain uh, the, the similarity between the different experiments or else even if you source the same polymer with the same degree of polymerization, it is possible to get different structures which would have very different properties. And then if you have a mixture of these which were originally manufactured in different ways, okay, so the n could be the same for uh, so you have let us say you are you have gone into the lab and there are 3 bottles in the lab and all of them have an n of uh, let us say 10 to the power 4. But all of them have come from different manufacturing sources and you do not know how they were manufactured. You cannot take those 3 different polymers and say oh because the ends are similar I will do the experiments between them and they should come out to be the same. They will not most likely they probably differ from each other because the final atomic structure the molecular structure changes then the physical behavior will also change. So, we will stop here today. Okay, thank you. <laughs>